start, Valerie, to, to start off the session. Okay. Hello. My name is Valerie Bashensky. I'm the president of the Halifax branch of the Canadian International Council. On behalf of the CIC and the McKechnie Institute, welcome to this event on COVID-19 and what it means for us at home and internationally. We have four distinguished panelists who will share their perspective on our current situation. And there will be time for questions. Please post your questions on the comments part of the Facebook page. And please indicate which panelist you would like to address your question. Um, it's my pleasure, pleasure to introduce our panelists to you. The first person who will speak to us is Gaynor Watson Creed. Dr. Watson Creed is Nova Scotia's acting deputy chief medical officer of health. And she's also Dalhousie Medical School's first assistant dean in a brand new portfolio serving and engaging society. Dr. Watson Creed is a passionate advocate for the role public health can play in advancing health equity. And she served on the One Nova Scotia Coalition. For those of you outside Nova Scotia, this was a bipartisan broad-based group of community leaders who were tasked with developing plans to meet Nova Scotia's challenge, challenges in terms of economic and social development. Our second panelist is Dr. Allison Kelvin, who is assistant professor at Dalhousie University and also a research scientist at the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology in the IWK Health Centre in Halifax. Her research focus is understanding the immune responses to emerging and re-emerging viruses, such as the one we're concerned with tonight, in high risk groups, such as infants and the elderly. And this is important in the design of effective vaccines. Dr. Kelvin is also a member of the World Health Organization Ad Hoc Advisory Committee for SARS-CoV-2 Model Development. Our next panelist is Bob Hewish, who is an Associate Professor in International Development Studies at Dalhousie University. His research explores global health inequity and the role of South-South cooperation to improve healthcare in resource poor settings. His current research focus is on the role of Cuban medical internationalism to build healthcare capacity in under-resourced settings in Pacific Island countries and how don donor nations are responding to env environmental crises in the Pacific region. Our next panelist is Kevin Quigley of the scholarly director at the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance and a professor in Dalhousie School of Public Administration. He specializes in public sector risk and crisis management, strategic management, and critical infrastructure protection. He has published widely for an academic audience and his 2017 book, Too Critical to Fail, How Canada Manages Threats to critical infrastructure was shortlisted for the Donner Prize. So I think we're ready for Dr. Watson Creed. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, and thank you uh, to the CIC and the McKechnie Institute for this opportunity this evening. Um, I have to admit, in all of the sort of haste to um, deal with the coronavirus outbreak. I've not, not prepared anything uh, specific for this evening to start the panel, but in having a conversation uh, with Dr. Quigley before uh, today, you know, I thought it might be an opportunity to give the folks who were uh, watching an opportunity to see just a little bit of sort of what happens behind the scenes when an outbreak is being managed. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna try and explain to you today. I um, have had the opportunity now to be a part of three pandemics in my public health career, which seems crazy to me. And I always said when I was doing my residency, um, I started my residency in public health and medicine in 1999 at McMaster University. And I had always said that that seemed to be just the opportune time to learn public health medicine, because during that time there was uh, certainly SARS, but uh, there was the the Walkerton inquiry, there was um, all of the events around 9-11 and all of the 
uh, concern there was about agents of bioterror at that time. Um, there were anthrax scares at that time. And so it just, and the whole world was doing pandemic influenza planning at that time. And so I felt like it was this fantastic crucible for learning um, about how the world organizes around uh, events like a, like a pandemic. And so I was in Toronto for the SARS outbreak. Um, I was a resident at McMaster University and we joke as residents that uh, outbreaks start at 4.30 on a Friday because they actually do. And so I was leaving uh, the health unit in, uh, in Hamilton, Ontario when the medical officer of health there at the time, who was Dr. Elizabeth Richardson, she's still there, um, sort of waved me in and said, you need to come into my office right now. And the entire of Ontario Public Health was on the phone and Toronto Public Health was describing what they were seeing and what they thought they would need, which in the short term was actually uh, negative pressure rooms and ICU beds. And I felt like my whole world kind of imploded um, to hear for the first time and to understand the concern and fear that those medical officers were holding for their communities at that time um, and how quickly folks were trying to mobilize. And I learned at that time that although we had been in all of these plans about pandemic and about uh, managing smallpox and anthrax at that time, all of it kind of got thrown out and we were able to take the bones of it and use it to shape the SARS response, but real life actually doesn't follow the plan. And that was probably the biggest learning that I had from that SARS outbreak. And by the way, the file that I was assigned to at the Ontario Ministry, very glamorous, was uh, SARS in sewage and whether or not sewage could be a uh, risk of transmission for SARS. So that's what I worked on uh, for my time at the ministry. Um, but it was an interesting learning to see that real life doesn't follow the plan. And so although the world knew what, it, you know, in some ways what to expect from our study of previous pandemics and and how they were managed. There was also so much about that event that we just could not have predicted. And so it went the way it went. Fast forward to uh, me coming, landing in the province of Nova Scotia and um, in 2005 and being a newly minted medical officer of health. Uh, and my first outbreaks here being uh, mumps of all things, but a massive mumps outbreak that actually ended up seeding the entire country. Um, and I'm still apologizing for that uh, to this day. Um, and then in 2009, we had H1N1 um, and Halifax, Nova Scotia, Windsor, Nova Scotia was the first jurisdiction in Canada to experience H1N1 at that time. We were the first jurisdiction in Canada to declare that we were seeing what we believed was a novel pandemic uh, influenza or a novel influenza of pandemic potential. Um, and if folks remember at the time, there were reports coming out of Mexico where we were hearing things like there's an illness and the CDC has sent their investigative team down there and the Public Health Agency of Canada had sent field epidemiologists there and folks were wondering what was happening in Mexico. And all of a sudden uh, it popped up in Windsor, Nova Scotia in this group of students that had returned from a trip to Mexico. Uh, and so we were into um, a novel influenza strain that became a pandemic uh, that year. And once again, I was reminded of the lesson that real life does not follow the plan. We had done so much pandemic planning between you know, 2000 and 2009, the world getting ready for this after SARS um, in 2003. And then here we were, and, um, sorry, apologies. <clears throat> On top of everything else, I also happen to have a cold, which is not COVID um, and that I blame entirely on my children. Um, so we, um, so here we were sort of managing H1N1 uh, at that time and, um, and looking to the lessons that we had learned from those other events that we had been involved in, but again, realizing that there was so much of it that we had to deal with uh, on the fly. And here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, you know, nobody had predicted, all of the models for pandemic had said at, at that point that we would be looking at um, avian influenza, which was emerging in Asia at that time, and that that pandemic would likely start on the west coast of Canada and would move east. Um, and that is not at all what happened. Nobody was looking at swine flu from South America um, or Central America, and certainly was not looking at Halifax, Nova Scotia as the first uh, site in Canada uh, to experience this. And so again, real life didn't follow the plan. Uh, and so now here we are in 2020 dealing with uh, coronavirus. And I feel like, again, those same lessons um, 
apply. You know, this is the one of all of those, you know, sort of previous ones that I've talked about. We looked at things like social distancing and mass gathering uh, cancellations and what could we do to sort of limit the spread along those lines and would it work, would school closures work, that type of thing. And folks will recall some of those conversations for H1N1 and we actually decided in looking at that virus and how it was tracking and in which populations that actually school closures were not an appropriate thing to do and actually the best way to track illness in school children for that particular one might be to keep them in school so we could see how it was tracking in, in those populations. This is a completely different event than that. And so here we are uh, looking at this novel coronavirus. It's not an influenza virus, which is what our pandemic plans uh, revolved around. And again, seeing that real life um, doesn't follow the plan. Having said that, there are some things about this outbreak that are um, in keeping with what we know about outbreak management. And it's the places that my colleagues and I fall back to um, whenever we're faced with something new. It's how we know how to do our jobs. It's how we know how to, um, manage the outbreak to the, to the best that we can. And so I'm just gonna bring up a, a few slides uh, just, just to share with you um, what those things are. So if any of you have seen me uh, give lectures on outbreak management before, you will have seen uh, me use these slides. Um, this is the list of steps in an outbreak that you will see from agencies like the World Health Organization or CDC and Atlanta. And they often uh, present the list exactly like this. And it looks very linear. It almost looks like it's in order, right? So the first thing you do is you prepare for your field work. So that's the work that you're going to do, finding cases, managing contacts of cases, figuring out who the contacts are and, and sort of uh, mapping out the chain of transmission of the disease. So you prepare for that work and then you establish that there actually is an outbreak that you need to investigate. So sometimes it looks like an outbreak and when you, because it looks like it's transmitting to multiple people and then when you actually See so if you go, actually it's confined to a small group of people and it's not gonna go any further than that and so we can stand down. And then you verify the diagnosis so that you know what exactly what it is that you're tracking and then you define and identify your cases. You describe and orient the data that you're collecting in terms of time, place, and person. That's the basis of our epidemiologic work that we do. You develop hypotheses around what you think is happening, where you think the transmission is gonna go next. You evaluate those hypotheses and you refine them. You carry out additional studies, you implement your control and prevention measures and communicate your findings. So that's what the CDC Atlanta often uh, uh, puts out as sort of the steps of outbreak management. Students of epidemiology will learn these as the steps of uh, outbreak management. And it's a good list. We do all of those things um, when we're managing an outbreak. But what I find interesting is that impl implement and control prevention, or sorry, implement control and prevention measures is listed as step nine here. And it's not meant to be a step-by-step -step list, but it's a funny positioning of it. Because in real life, uh, certainly what, what we see and, and certainly what I always practice is this. So this is a framework that I was taught actually as a resident in, in Ontario uh, when I was learning about all of this in that context, sorry, Mockerton and others. And what you'll see public health agencies do is this, when we figure out that something is happening in our communities, the first thing that we will do is put in place control measures. That's this X here um, in the third line down. We'll start our investigation after that. And the reason is simple. You wanna put in place the control measures as early as you can to prevent as many people as possible from transmitting the disease onward. And so before we know anything else, as soon as we know that we've got a communicable disease at, at play, it's often, you know, these are the phone calls that we're making to each other and to our public health staff at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock at night when we first get a call about a communicable disease, if it's really serious, we'll call the staff and say, please get in touch with that patient and let them know that they can do this, but they can't do these things. They can go here, but they can't go to this place. Please let them know that they need to, um, you know, remove themselves from these family members and they can't go to work the next morning, that type of thing. We'll put those control measures in first that gives us the time to figure out what else we might need to do in our investigation in order to manage the rest, uh, the rest of the outbreak. So um, real life looks more like this. It looks more like this, you know, sort of this grid of different activities that might be happening, happening concurrently. They might be happening at different points in time. They will continue late into the outbreak. Um, but of all the things on this, uh, on this grid, the one that is the most important and the most difficult to do, maybe not to do well, but I would say the most difficult to get right, in fact, impossible to ever get truly right, is this one. 
communicate. So often you will find in outbreaks, um, folks are looking for information, especially if it's a, you know, something like this, where the entire world is affected. Everybody wants to know almost at every minute what's happening right now, what's happening next. The problem is that while we, you know, in public health appreciate the need for that information, we're doing this middle X of investigating. We're trying to find out the answers to those questions. And so the lag time between the investigation and the communication can cause frustration, certainly for communications officials, but it's critically important that we understand that so we know what control measures to put in place next to stay ahead of the outbreak for as long as we can. So when I'm teaching outbreak management, I often say to residents, you know, you will all have a critique of the communication plan that was used for this outbreak or the communication plan that was used for that outbreak. And some of those critiques will be valid. And my advice is don't ever expect to get the communication right because the things evolve rapidly, they will change. And the trying to keep up with that um, is really only gonna be about just doing the best that you can. Uh, and so I, I tend to use this grid more than the CDC list because I find it's a more realistic picture of how the outbreak actually unfolds. It's never linear. It's often multiple activities happening at once to get uh, ahead of the outbreak. But we do in every outbreak, and this is the same uh, with, with this one with coronavirus, we fall back to our basic tools, our basic good foundational epidemiologic science that drives how we manage outbreaks. We collect line lists, which are the lists of uh, affected persons and their contacts and information about them, like what were their symptoms, when did the symptoms start, so we can get a sense of who is this affecting, who is it not affecting, and if we can get a sense of that, then we know who to look out for next in that affected group um, so that we can stay ahead of that outbreak again. We use that information uh, to, to generate epidemic curves. Uh, which are those fancy sort of uh, curves that show, and folks would have seen these, for example, the, the curve in China, which is now back to baseline, that show basically how the epidemic has tra tracked over time. Um, we use maps and mapping, and this has been uh, an extraordinary uh, addition to this particular outbreak worldwide, is the degree of mapping that's being supported by the WHO, and folks will have seen the online uh, coronavirus tracker from uh, Hopkins University in the US, that uh, from Johns Hopkins, that um, is really showing in real time, they're updating it multiple times a day, where the uh, outbreak is and how it's going in those uh, various affected countries. We've talked a lot about this, this uh, particular notion of the r naught, um, which is the reproductive rate of the organism at play. So how quickly does one infection become multiple infections in a group of, of people, that type of thing. Uh, attack rates is a similar notion. So what proportion of the uh, population is likely to be affected, we look at that. And then in some cases, we're able to in implement case control studies, not so much for an outbreak like this, but certainly for foodborne outbreaks, we'll often do that um, to, uh, to see if we can get a sense as to what the source of the outbreak was. But in this particular case, we haven't had the need to do that in part because the, the, the source is, is relatively evident now. So we're still relying on our basic tools in, in this one. Uh, and of course, we're doing all of this to do this flattening of the curve that folks have heard so much about. And I was in an interesting conversation today with some uh, colleagues from across the country. We've been meeting twice a week, sometimes more frequently to talk about the outbreaks in our different provinces and where do we think we need to go next as a country. And we have all been focused on this notion of flattening the curve, but we had one colleague from BC who reminded us that actually, as long as we still think we have the opportunity, the imperative for public health in Canada is actually to squash the curve, um, to obliterate the curve, to completely demolish that curve if we can. Here in Nova Scotia, we have 68 cases reported as of today. Um, that's not an impossible dream for us to think that with 68 cases and a population of nearly a million that we could get far enough ahead of this, that we could, um, that we could significantly flatten the curve um, if not obliterate it. The, the point of doing that is multifold. Certainly overall, we wanna reduce the amount of uh, morbidity and mortality, the damage to humans that this uh, disease will, ca will cause. But in addition to that, we wanna avoid overwhelming the, ho the hospital system uh, with disease. And so the horizontal line that you see here is hospital capacity. And what we wanna do is keep the curve below the capacity of the hospitals to cope. What you're seeing in Italy is uh, the, the way that those systems have been incapacitated uh, by this outbreak. And so they've not been able to flatten the curve. So their curve looks very much more like the one to the left 
where they've got a large number of cases now, not because there was no inter intervention, but because their intervention may have started uh, too late for them to slow the spread uh, of the disease. And so they've completely overwhelmed their hospital capacity. Uh, and that's in part now contributing to the mortality, the death rates that we're seeing in Italy where hospitals can't cope. So our job here is to stay below that hospital capacity line and flatten this curve as much as we can. It means that we will have a longer outbreak, but overall we would have a much less impactful outbreak. To give you a sense of what that longer outbreak means, um, BC I think is now entering something like their 11th week since their first reported case of coronavirus. Uh, here in Nova Scotia, we are entering our uh, second week. And uh, China's outbreak was sort of from end to end about 10 weeks. So we're already seeing with the Canadian efforts that our curve is longer than the Chinese curve. If you use BC as a starting point, that's good news. How much longer that curve will be remains to be seen. It's gonna be measured likely in months, not in weeks. Um, but that is the point of the interventions that we're doing is to flatten that curve as much as possible, as possible so that we stay below the hospital intervention, uh, you know, sort of maximum capacity. So all of this is, is you know, kind of routine for us in public health. This is a science that we know and we see an outbreak like this and we say, okay, so this is another one, but it's not so different than the other ones and we can't cope. And I think in, in many ways right now with coronavirus, that's where we are. But what I have found fascinating about this particular outbreak uh, is a few things. Uh, one is, you know, this outbreak is happening at a time in the world where we have never had access to the types of technology that we have now. So the way that information flowed in this particular outbreak to me has been extraordinary. The mapping of the genome of this coronavirus uh, in the very, very early weeks of the Chinese outbreak is just unprecedented. The sharing of information, the standing up of those uh, real-time dashboards around coronavirus is uh, extraordinary. The fact that we can, to some degree, with some success, it's early days in Nova Scotia, we'll see how it goes, move to virtual platforms for working and managing an outbreak is unprecedented. Um, the number of citizens who are weighing in with ideas and opinions and, um, and uh, theories, some good, some not good, about coronavirus and where it comes from is extraordinary. Uh, and so I don't know what, it, what that all means uh, for how this outbreak ultimately will, um, you know, sort of be recorded by, by comparison to the other ones I've, I've mentioned. But I, you know, of all the things that are similar to me about this pandemic versus the ones I've been in, those are the things that stand out to me right now as being the most uh, different and um, interesting, I guess, is what I would say. So uh, by way of open, opening remarks, I think I'm just gonna leave it there. I hope that's what the moderators intended. Um, and I think it's on to the next panelist from here. All right, Allison, you're you're all set. Okay, great. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Allison Kelvin, and again, I'm an assistant professor at Dalhousie University. My research focuses on emerging viruses and re-emerging viruses. So um, this is, these types of viruses are what I study. I'm really interested in how um, uh, the host or your body um, responds to infection and understanding what those responses are to develop therapeutics for the disease that it causes or prophylactics such as um, vaccines. So I wanted to tell you how this started for me um, and because my research um, is focused on emerging and re-emerging viruses. I follow what's called ProMed Mail. And um, on December 31st at one in the morning, I was on Christmas vacation and you know going to bed late and 
I got this email from ProMed Mail saying um, that there was an undiagnosed undi pneumonia in China and a request for information. And this is a piece from this email. And uh, through this ProMed Mail, which is kind of an infectious disease social network, um, it's they bring out different, anytime there's an outbreak of any infectious disease around the world, ProMed Mail sends out a notification of what's going on um, and what the news is around this outbreak. So this particular one, undiagnosed pneumonia in China, and they were asking um, for requests for information. And this was an urgent notice on the treatment of pneumonia of unknown cause. And of course that set off alarm bells in my mind. How could they not know what um, was causing this, what the infectious agent that was causing this pneumonia. And then uh, I went back and you know, reading through this email, there was a lot of warnings here. And again, we're, we're back on December 30th, 31st. And here it said, according to the above documents, and this is all written in uh, the correspondence, uh, according to the urgent notice from the superior, some medical institutions in Wuhan have successfully appeared patients with pneumonia of unknown cause. And then it gets to me very, um, very moving. Uh, the email says, all medical institutions should strengthen the management of outpatient and emergency departments. So really a warning going out to the world saying that there was this infectious agent causing pneumonia. Um, they didn't know the origin of this and watch out in your hospitals as you have patients come in and be ready to manage those. And of course, this is what we're seeing now. And hopefully some of, some of this um, warning that went out was picked up by um, people in Canada. So on January 9th, which was only about 10 days after, the infectious agents was identified as a coronavirus, um, but this was a previously uncharacterized coronavirus that we now know called to be called SARS-CoV-2. So I, as soon as this was identified, um, because I have an interest in the, uh, these emerging and re-emerging viruses, I contacted my colleagues. Uh, the first one, uh, Daryl Falzerano at Vito Intervac, and he is a coronavirus um, expert. And, uh, and I also contacted Jason Kinderchuk at the University of Manitoba and my colleagues here at Dalhousie University. So to Daryl, I said, um, can we get the permits in place? So again, this was right after January 9th. <clears throat> can we get the permits in place to study this virus? Um, I think it's gonna be important. Or he said to me, he wasn't too worried about this virus at that time. Um, and then with my colleagues here at Dalhousie, we um, began uh, forming a team to work on this virus, which I'll talk about later. So just for some information, I really wanted my talk to uh, give some information on this SARS-CoV-2 virus and what it's doing to um, our bodies when it's infecting. Us. But to start, I wanted to address what is a virus, just um, to differentiate that from our own cells and from bacterium. A virus, its full definition is that it's a submicroscopic obligate intracellular cellular parasite, which means it cannot function by itself, cannot be active by itself. It is only active once it's inside um, its host cell. So um, basically it's not going to, um, it's not, again, not gonna be active unless it's able to get inside and kind of take over the host cell machinery to make more virus. And this is why we call it an intracellular parasite. Uh, the word virus comes from the word meaning toxin or poison. 
So a little bit more about the SARS-CoV-2. It is short for Severe Acute Respiratory Coronavirus 2. And what the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, again, it's a coronavirus and it's enveloped and you can kind of see the envelope here. Um, and around the envelope are all these protein spikes. Um, and these spikes are what allows the virus to get into the host cell. And actually the word corona came from um, how the virus looks under the microscope, that it looks like it has this crown uh, surrounding it. It was called uh, SARS-CoV-2 because um, the genetic sequence put it most similar to the human SARS coronavirus from the 2002-2003 outbreak. But what was, what's interesting is that these um, coronaviruses, so SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, uh, cause a severe pneumonia. But typically coronaviruses, which there are a couple that circulate in the human population right now, they cause the com a common cold. So and typically leading to mild symptoms. Uh, what's alarming though about this SARS-CoV-2 virus is that it's the third coronavirus to cause severe pneumonia, possibly leading to death since 2002. The first one being SARS, SARS-CoV, the second one being MERS, um, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, and now we have SARS-CoV-2. So um, this is really an indication that we need to start to pay more attention to coronaviruses and how they're spilling over from the animal reservoir into people. So, um, what, what does this do to our bodies? This SARS-CoV-2 virus infects the cells that line our respiratory tract. And these are, they are called epithelial cells. And the reason why this SARS uh, coronavirus uh, causes severe pneumonia is because it infects the respiratory epithelial cells that are in the outer reaches of our lungs down here. Whereas uh, the more mild, um, Coronaviruses are known to infect the upper respiratory tract and not um, typically make it down to the lower reaches. So this virus causes a range of symptoms, which um, asymptomatic uh, disease or asymptomatic people have been noted. But typically, the mild disease that um, is caused by this virus is uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath. And then often there's evidence of pneumonia on x-ray or CT scan. Uh, pneumonia can range from um, being severe, uh, is, is comes in really a range, um, where the more severe cases of this SARS-CoV-2 have severe pneumonia, which leads to acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. And then this can also lead to sepsis and possibly uh, multi-organ failure. So what happens in pneumonia, and you can see in this lower panel, that um, the, the epithelial cell lining of the lung shown here, so this is the lower reaches of the lung, starts to thicken compared to the healthy lung above an A. And then also there's a buildup of fluid and cells in um, the lower reaches of the lung. So that's what we're talking about with severe pneumonia. And the um, people who are at a higher risk of developing this severe disease from uh, SARS-CoV-2 are older ages, so over 65, people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. So I also wanted to give just a bit of insight into the uh, molecular differences between mild and severe disease and what happens when those cells in the lower reaches of our lungs are infected. So here um, I'm showing corona, SARS-2 coronavirus infecting our epithelial cells. And once um, the, this virus infects our epithelial cells, there's this release of cytokines from the cell. And these are protein messengers that are released from the cell, from the epithelial cell, to relay a message to 
um, our immune cells. And some of these might be inflammatory and some of them um, might have other, play other roles. So after the cytokines are released, these protein messengers, there's this switch in the mild cases from cytokine release to antibody production in our B cells. And here you can see the antibodies being released from a B cell. And the purpose of these antibodies are to go and uh, kind of encapsulate the virus and neutralize it and stop it from being able to infect the neighboring cells around um, the infected cell. And this is how we typically would clear a virus from our bodies. Uh, so stepwise for the mild disease, we go from cytokine release from an infected cell, recruitment of cleanup cells, and then activation of our antibody producing cells. But during severe disease, what seems to happen is instead of being able to switch to this uh, activation of our anti antibody producing cell, there's an overabundance of cytokines being released from the infected cell, which um, recruits many inflammatory cells, which cause damage to the lungs. And we often call this a cytokine storm. And again, um, this block, somehow the antibody producing cells are being blocked. And this is just a histology, histological section um, showing the difference between the lungs of um, a normal, in a normal healthy animal compared to one that had been infected with, this is the original SARS coronavirus, where there's this thickening of um, the epithelial wall and accumulation of fluid you can see from um, the, the pink staining here. And because of this, where there isn't proper uh, gas exchange um, between from the outside to the um, blood vessels inside the organism. So where are we now? Um, this is the John, John Hopkins um, map that was referred to earlier. Um, and this is from today, just a couple of hours ago, looking across the world, really um, obvious. You can see this is what a pa pandemic looks like. The red dots show where positive cases have been identified. And the larger the red dot, the more the cases. Uh, China still has the most reported cases at over 80,000. Um, in total across the world, there's over 450,000 cases with more than 20,000 deaths. Uh, looking at Canada, we have only have um, uh, just under 3,000 cases reported with 110 recovered and 27 deaths. So. Uh, we want to be watching these numbers to calculate um, our epidemic or pandemic statistics. So just as a comparison between flu and uh, our other coronaviruses, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is shown here second. Um, our reproductive rate for this virus has been calculated to be between two and three. So the number of people that a single infected person will go on to infect is between two to three people. But um, what's important to remember is that just as flattening the curve, we have the power to change this reproductive rate by not allowing the virus to spread and be transmitted to other people. So far, the case fatality rates, the number of people that have died from this virus out of the number of people who have confirmed um, to have it is about 3%. Um, compared to flu, the, the statistics are very different. Flu has a lower reproductive rate and a lower case fatality rate. Uh, I guess um, looking to SARS and MERS, they both have higher case fatality rates, um, but these, these were able, MERS is, was able to be um, controlled because it has a very low reproductive number. Um, compared to uh, our SARS-CoV-2. 
So what are we doing about this? I spoke a bit about our Dalhousie COVID-19 rapid response team. Um, we initiated this team shortly after the virus was identified. So right now, um, these are members of the Dalhousie Microbiology and Immunology Department, and we are members of the Canadian Center for Vaccinology. So we have a group that's working on vaccines, a group that's working on antivirals, and then a group that's working on point of care diagnostics. So looking at our vaccines, um, uh, Roy Duncan and Chris Richardson have both designed their um, their own vaccines. Roy Duncan has been uh, collaborating with a company called Entos. He has, a, has um, developed a DNA vaccine which can quickly be scaled up uh, for human use, which is the advantage of using a DNA vaccine. But of course, um, this vaccine needs to be, we're just starting evaluations now. Chris Richardson, on the other hand, has developed more traditional vaccines, um, which are based around the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Dennis Kapersky and Craig McCormick are net right now screening antivirals and small molecules that have been already approved, FDA approved um, to see if any of these can be used uh, for inhibiting virus replication um, or other uh, parts of the virus life cycle. And since, because they're sticking to already approved um, small molecules or antivirals, we hope that this will fast track um, the use to humans if they hit a good candidate. And then finally, David Kelvin is working on a point of care diagnostic where he's hoping to um, develop a kit to help stratify severe and mild patients by evaluating biomarkers of severe disease. Um, so together we're, we're working on this problem and hoping to have some positive results soon. So thank you very much. Okay, Bob, you should be good to go. All right. There we go. Thanks, folks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Professor Bob Hewish from uh, the International Development Studies Department here at Dalhousie. And I want to chat with you about how these issues we've been talking about so far tonight and how the world is dealing with COVID-19 is really more of an issue about disease rather than an issue of health. And why those terms are more than semantics. It's because the moral foundations of a health system are gonna matter enormously in times of pandemic and in global health. So quarantines and isolation, which many people are experiencing right now are perhaps some of the most ancient of all forms of public health interventions. And with them come very ancient problems, issues of stigma, hoarding, and panic. They've always been part of the equation and often racial, national, or derogatory labels are given to viruses and diseases that spread across the globe. And that only reinforces stigma. Uh, it doesn't help matters at all when US President Donald Trump, uh, as this slide shows, crosses out the word Corona in his speaking notes and inserts Chinese on top of it. Already many have reported incidents of discrimination, stigmatization, and even violence in the US, the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Fortunately, the Center for Disease Control in the United States contradicts the president with its website about reducing stigma as do many other academics and politicians. But world leaders like Mr. Trump, ones that made their way into positions of power based on politics of division, conflict and misinformation, give the virus tremendous advantage in this time. Mr. Trump just announced today that he is growing tired of the social distancing and isolation at a time when most mindful politicians and public health workers are actually reinforcing the call to keep isolation in effect. In the US, as people witness the death of friends and loved ones, Trump won't be able to label this pandemic as a CNN inspired conspiracy. It's the consequences will be firmly around his neck. And I mentioned the United States specifically because the structure of healthcare systems matter and they matter enormously in times of pandemic. Universal systems like Britain, Israel, South Korea, Canada are often in better shape to mobilize resources and to protect health workers 
rather than dysfunctional systems. And by dysfunctional systems, I don't just mean under-resourced ones. I mean systems like that in the United States, uh, where despite its wealth, despite its excellence in medical sciences, is a system that discourages people from using it. As one out of every two bankruptcies in that country is related to healthcare costs, it is optimized for fee-paying treatments and it lacks the moral foundations to provide health for all. Uh, if you're one of the 28 million uninsured Americans who could not pay for COVID-19 treatment, or 11 million illegal migrants, or millions more without sick pay or an inability to work from home, you have every financial reason to avoid testing, treatment, and isolation during this time. So today, the entire world faces the entire world faces a pandemic. And despite the enormous amount of wealth, resources, money, and technology that we have committed to global health and to this virus in particular, the entire world is relying ultimately on ancient methods as vanguards, not the front line of slowing down its, its spread. And in doing so, everyone, all of us, need to be mindful of the ancient problems that can come with this method, such as stigma. But there's also new problems that can emerge, particularly in the unique age in which we live. And that, of course, comes down to inequality. As much as we've heard such good information about how advanced we are with the technology of understanding this virus today, inequality is another matter. So take a look at this graph here that I've put together, which shows life expectancy on the left going up and then income on the bottom. This is global health versus global wealth. And if we take a look at this in this way, you see that uh, 1910, back in just before the era of Spanish flu broke out, that the world was between 50 years of age and just over 20 in what is India and Bangladesh today. Wealth-wise, Switzerland being the most wealthy country in the world, but then poorer countries like Malawi uh, were also part of the, the picture here. And here, going through the, uh, the years, uh, Asia's Spanish flu, moving forward, you see that many of these countries have very different relationships when it comes from wealth and health. 1930s, the depression, there was famine in the Soviet Union at that time. But as we see moving into World War II and then after the World War II years, we see that uh, many of these countries start to increase, both in terms of life expectancy and in terms of national wealth. Many countries moving up and more to the, to the right. Uh, this, is, this is what many people say, look, we've made such progress, such incredible progress of improving both global health and global wealth over the past 100 years. In many ways, that's correct, because the countries in 1910 are no longer in that little zone where they were, but instead, we actually see enormous inequality. We see where these bubbles have moved. They've moved to, uh, well, basically, uh, a differentiation in wealth that we've never seen before, and also that in terms of health, where most of the world was sick and poor back in the era of Spanish flu, now there's quite a bit of wealth and, and resources today. However, uh, those numbers uh, that we see today aren't equal. Uh, we don't have time tonight to get into the play-by-play, -play, but the theme is similar. When Spanish flu hit, most of the world was sick and poor. Now only a percentage is. In 2020, some people are enormously wealthy and others are dependent on robust health systems, but others are not. And what's more, it's not just the inequality between nations that's a concern, it's the inequality within nations that's the greatest concern. There's First Nations and Northern communities, they bear increased risk, not just to COVID-19, but to health issues more broadly than the rest of Canada. And the same could be said of Maori communities in New Zealand or the suburbs of Paris or London. In San Francisco, you can actually map out the health inequalities block by block between rich and poor. So the point is that just because COVID-19 is consuming every calorie of our daily lives right now, our interactions, the, the, the structure of our economy, it does not mean that the daily grind of health challenges have come to an end. So as this graph here shows that the total, the total vi uh, uh, cases of the virus has been increased day by day, but the broader global health picture looks something like this. Every single day that this virus has gone on, Roughly 810 women, they don't make it each day due to complications in childbirth, preventable complications in childbirth. And 96% of them are in low resource settings. Each day we lose some 26,000 people from, from cancers and 70% of those people are in poor and middle income countries. 
We also lose 49,000 people a day around the world from cardiovascular disease, and 75% of those deaths are in low-resource settings. These are all horrendous mortality counts, and the global economy, the global system, did not derail itself to prevent or stop those issues. But now we have derailed our system completely for this virus, which we think does not discriminate, meaning that anyone is vulnerable. But unlike heart disease, cancers, and maternal mortality, that does discriminate towards the poor, COVID-19 gives the impression that it's indifferent. But rest assured, it's not. Healthcare systems around the world that work with deep inequality will fare the worst of this. In India, social distancing and self-isolation is impossible in a Mumbai slum. Up to 23,000 people can be condensed into a square kilometer. Western Africa, access to food, markets, resources are essential in maintaining health. And any disruption can have serious secondary health consequences there. But these are the ancient consequences of ancient methods of public health. So why then is a response to COVID-19 grounded in such methods? Simply put, Isolation is a non-pharmaceutical intervention against a virus. It's about dealing with an illness. It's not about ensuring health. And it's funny how we think about health. If I ask you to define health, could you do it? If you look at a dictionary or a first year medical textbook, you'll see that health is a widely defined as a lack of disease. And in this sense, it's defined as something that it is not. Many health professionals uh, do define health as a state free of illness. And that in itself is a bit odd, it, 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 and it exposed itself during pandemics. If you look up the definition, say of an apple in the dictionary, it will give you a very detailed description of fruit in terms of the texture and the taste, and you may even learn that it's part of the rose family. The definition of an apple does not read, it is not an orange. Yet our definition of health often reads, it is not illness. So this is why many health systems struggle globally in times like this, and certainly there's there's money, there's resources, there's technologies to cure, treat, and heal, but to maintain health in times of inequality is a challenge without proper resources. Cuba, a country with health services for foreigners and nationals that does very well, applies the same idea to those in isolation that are provided for, and their income is also provided for as low as it is. Still, it's assured. In Cuba, doctors and nurses, community members do check on people in their homes, in isolation to assure their wellness, to assure that they're able to participate in these quarantines. And what's more, Cuba just sent hundreds of its own health workers to Italy to help with overwhelm system there. Now this approach, the way that, that Cuba's based the long-term foundation on ensuring population health is in many ways exemplary. It's, it ensures health to their own, it helps others, not through fear, but through conviction, compassion, cooperation, which is exactly how to handle this crisis. Uh, the challenge then is for other systems around the world that are dysfunctional, that focus only on illness rather than health. The, the disjointed health systems like that in the US that incentivizes people not to engage with it, if anything, it encourages hoarding and poor behavior. And coupled with that is a lack of assurance and insurance for vulnerable populations. So right now, Airbnb is encouraging homeowners in Connecticut, the Hamptons, New Jersey, to open their homes to wealthy Manhattanites so they can quarantine for a couple of days away from the fuss and bus of the city of New York while it is scrambling. Now that city has 5% of all cases worldwide and that number is doubling every three days. The governor has offered to employ any nurse or doctor from surrounding states to help, but the nurses and doctors are struggling to find protective gear, hand sanitizer or groceries after the wealthy clean up the shelves during the day while they are on shift. The US will be the one to watch during this pandemic as we will see how under-equipped that system is to handle a pandemic. So like I said, there are other health concerns that are going on and to which we did not derail our global economy for. We've done that now for this case. Isolation will be effective for, for societies who can do it. It'll be devastating for the global poor who cannot isolate or who rely on uh, who, or, or who rely on supply chains that are now disrupted. And for societies that choose to ignore public health advice, the consequences will be dire as well. So we can expect serious mortality outcomes from this pandemic. We've heard about the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions being vulnerable, but recognize that poverty and marginalization are also pre-existing conditions. And this virus will take its opportunities with those communities around the world. When we emerge from this disruption, Will we rebuild systems that support health for all? Or will we repeat mistakes and rely on systems and methods that are simply 
outdated for this global health demand of the 21st century inequality. Thanks very much. All right, Kevin, you should be ready to go. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much to my fellow presenters also. Um, I thought that I would uh, spend a bit of time uh, talking about uh, some risk concepts. Um, let me just... Uh, let's see. Pull up here, share screen. Okay, great, I think I'm okay. All right, so I thought I would just go through a few, uh, sort of apply a sort of risk governance concept uh, or risk governance lens on this uh, problem and use some concepts to explore this issue and think about some current debates and some debates that I think we're gonna be having, um, if not now soon, although I think Bob has alluded to, uh, to some of them already in his presentation. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, risk governance and the precautionary principle. Uh, but I thought I would start by uh, reminding us of a tragedy, a different kind of tragedy that happened uh, almost two years ago. So on April 6th, we'll be recognizing the second anniversary of the humble bus crash. Highly emotional issue, uh, 14 people died on site, another two died uh, back in the hospital. It got a lot of uh, media attention, very tragic, very emotional, lots of grief. And I'm sure we, we remember that event. Um, as a risk analyst, when we put these kinds of events together with COVID-19, we see important differences uh, when we think about the risk of, of car safety, road safety, um, and deaths on the road, and something like COVID-19. Both risk issues, uh, both dramatic in their own way, uh, but the knowledge claims about them are quite different, and I want to just uh, unpack that a little bit. So as a risk person, I always sort of think about this equation. Uh, risk can be a calculation of probability times consequence. So when we think about road safety, um, although we can't predict exactly when a road accident will happen and if someone will die, and of course, if we could, we'd stop it from happening. But um, we do know with a certain amount of regularity how many people die each year on the road. So it's about 2,000 people die every year. On Canadian roads. In the United States, by the way, it's about 36,000 people a year die. Um, so that, that's the consequence and then also the probability become very measurable to us. Uh, and when I say consequence, I'm not thinking about it, you know, necessarily specifically through uh, the grief of the families, of course, which is different, uh, a different measure. But um, the way in which we think about those risks, we normalize them um, and it's some rational calculation, I suppose. There's a trade-off uh, that we accept the risks of, of road safety, maybe because we don't have a choice, because this is the way our society functions, maybe because on the balance we think uh, using cars uh, is a net benefit for us. Um, but as I say, also there's a sort of uh, uh, socialization process where it's just absorbed and uh, normalized uh, the risks associated with road safety. So we don't think about it so much, but we can measure it. And because we can measure it and we can put dollar values on life the way the insurance industry does, um, this sort of thing is left to insurance markets to, to regulate, although government also plays a role in terms of uh, gathering data around the issue, setting standards, road standards, speed limits, uh, standards of road construction, and also things like training, uh, uh, training, licensing people, things like that. So in terms of controlling the risk, we have a capacity to gather information, set standards, and change behavior. When we think about something like uh, COVID-19, however, it's quite a bit different because we have a, a more, much more difficult time than what we can call an uncertain or emerging circumstance for which the data isn't quite so clear. Uh, and I think uh, Gaynor alluded to this uh, point earlier around the uncertainty involved uh, and the cases aren't exactly quite the same and they emerge in different ways. There has obviously been a lot of learning progress. There's still 
uh, uncertainty around how these issues emerge. So I often use a, a, a model by the International Risk Governance Council, um, which is a, a group that's been doing some great work for about the last 15 years at least on risk governance. And they classify risk in four different ways, which I, I think gives us some uh, a bit of a roadmap in terms of how to think about these risks. So simple, complex, uncertain, and ambiguous. When we're thinking about a simple risk, we're thinking about, there's something particularly simple about it in terms of the calculation, uh, but these are risks for which we have a lot of data and experience. We can uh, more comfortably uh, attain probability data and understand the consequence data to come up with some sort of risk measure. And, and your road accidents tend to fall into this category, road safety. Complex risks are industrial failures, um, you know, rail derailment, uh, pardon me, uh, train derailments, uh, bridge incidents, uh, things that are uh, industrial in nature and their complexity. And they usually depend a lot on expert advice. An uncertain risk is a, a, a risk for which we do not have enough data to really understand the risk. Uh, the probability, the consequence, the reach. And when I talk about the uncertainty of the risk, I'm not, I'm not talking strictly about the health consequences, but also the economic consequences. So there's really a lot of uncertainty that informs the risk. There's an absence of reliable data. When we have an ambiguous risk, we're talking about a risk maybe where we do have the data, but there's a lot of uh, disagreement over what it means. And it usually a lot of, involves a lot of political negotiation over uh, how to understand or negotiate a uh, a risk response. So there's a lot more politics and ambiguous risk compared to uncertain risk. I'm going to come back to insert our ambiguous risk in a second. I'll just put this framework up. This is the IRGC's framework and they have a, a risk governance model that has four stages. Um, first stage is pre-assessment. Pre-assessment's about where do you get your data from? How do you frame this problem? How do you understand this problem? What are the scientific conventions that you use when you're uh, assessing this problem? Then you move to risk appraisal which is on the top risk assessment, which is largely about technical assessment by technical expert, experts, but also it's about concern assessment. Are people worried about this? Do we have polling data? Do we know how people feel? How stable is it? And then we get to tolerability and acceptability. How tolerable is the risk? Are we prepared to tolerate this risk? And to what extent are we prepared to tolerate it? And of course, who decides on that uh, particular level of tolerance? And then we eventually get to a box called risk management where we develop some options to address the risk. The thing to think about is risk management is not strictly about options analysis. It really starts at the very beginning from the data that you get, how you collect your data, how you technically assess your risk, how public opinion and concern assessment fits into it, and your ability to tolerate the risk. And so as I say, with road safety, we tolerate risks. Um, with things like uh, COVID-19, it becomes a little bit more complicated because we don't quite understand it yet. Um, so one of the interesting things about uh, the IRGC framework is that they, um, they say that different stages require different levels of attention. So any kind of risk would go through each of the four stages. Um, but when we're talking about an uncertain risk, we're particularly concerned about tolerance. That is a key question. When we're facing uncertainty, when we don't have reliable data to know exactly what the future looks like, what the consequences and reach of the risk will be, to what extent can we tolerate this risk? So uncertain risks um, exist when there's a lack of clear scientific basis for decision-making. Uh, the kinds of risks we talk about usually that are uncertain risks are terrorist attacks, climate disasters, and pandemic. And they'll be classified as uncertain or sometimes they can be referred to as emerging risk. The emerging and uncertain in, in the IRGC is pretty similar. Uncertain risks pose particular challenges. While experts can offer a range of estimates, they may be unable to predict with confidence if an event will, be, uh, will occur and what will be affected by it. And as a result, these kinds of risks can lead to mistakes in, in, in our assessments, in the advice we give. They're also subject to a lot of bias, particular bias, people's emotional reactions to certain uh, potentially uh, anxious situations are not particularly anxious, but it plays right into bias because we don't really have a lot of facts to offset those biases, if the facts in fact would help. And maybe relate back to some of the communications challenges that uh, Gainer referred to also. And it also leads, it leads to volatility, overreaction, underreaction by people in terms of how they consume healthcare, or also volatility in terms of um, um, markets, uh, as we've seen with the stock market reacting up and down uh, to, the, to the uncertainty. So we would classify COVID-19 as an uncertain risk. And so one of the things we want to think about when we're thinking about an uncertain risk is um, 
given that we're facing uncertainty and uh, how do we want to address it? So one of the key questions is, is it potentially catastrophic or irreversible? Because there's a lot of uncertainty in life. Um, but we want to think a little bit about uh, before we make our play, we, we want to think, is there the potential for a catastrophic outcome or an irreversible outcome? So when we're thinking about environmental issues, for instance, uh, ir irreversible becomes a very key point. Um, so if it's a catastrophic potential or irreversible potential, uh, then we want to take a precautionary stance. Now, I would say with COVID-19 right now, the, the stance is precautionary and it's low tolerance. Um, we're, we're trying to manage that risk down as much as we can or manage that uh, curve down that uh, Gaynor showed us. We do accept some risks though, of course. You can see a little bit of uh, uh, inequality in terms of the distribution of the risks because obviously the border is still open for trade. We're still letting trucks move goods around, things like that. So there's still a level of exposure and uh, folks working in grocery stores and whatnot. So we're still accepting some because there's some sort of risk trade-off presumably that's going on. Um, and uh, so although we're managing the risk down, we still accept that there's still a certain amount of, uh, still amount of, a certain amount of risk that we're prepared to accept at a sort of macro meso level, even though there might be some, you know, specific individuals who are accepting that risk on our behalf. So precautionary approaches are necessarily robust. These are big, full-on responses uh, that, that probably go beyond the risk, beyond the nature of the risk, but we're not entirely sure how it's gonna play out. So it is natural when we're thinking about an uncertain risk for which we do not have enough reliable data, that we're gonna take a naturally robust stance. That stance is gonna be a very expensive stance. It's gonna be expensive in terms of frontline operations, uh, but it's also gonna be expensive in terms of economic consequences. And we're seeing that uh, play out in terms of uh, the slowing of the economy in reaction to uh, various policies we've adopted uh, in the face of this particular uncertain uh, threat. So the precautionary principle gives rise to a number of controversies and questions, and I want to flag a few of them. And uh, I think these are good, these are questions not that we're asking right now, but I think we're going to be asking at some point. And um, I think in some cases in the U.S., and I'll pick up on this in a second, but in some cases in the U.S., they're already asking some of these questions. So one is the the, the definition that we actually use for the precautionary principle, because uh, the literature would suggest there's quite a bit of variation. And some of the, the kind of controversies or questions that come out of the definition of the precautionary principle revolve around some of these questions. What is the strength of evidence that is required? Uh, is it strong evidence um, that's required in order to take a precautionary approach? Is it sufficient evidence, quote unquote, uh, is it adequate uh, or even inconclusive evidence? So if we're in a face a state of uncertainty, is that sufficient to take a precautionary approach? So those we could be in a state of, when we were looking at an uncertain risk, we could say the situation is inconclusive or it's sufficient um, or maybe even strong, but in time, the answer to that question might change about what kind of evidence is required to justify the precautionary stance that we're taking. The second thing is what is the necessary action that we take? What does it mean to be precautionary? Do we eliminate the risk? Uh, do we adopt cost-effective actions to eliminate the risk, or do we merely consider adopting uh, necessary, uh, necessarily robust actions? Who provides the proof? Who pays for the collection of that proof? Um, and who makes the decision? Are some other things that will come along uh, when we start thinking about the precautionary principle and some of the controversies that may emerge in time in the face of this particular risk? I'll just highlight that this, this debate's already starting to play out a little bit in the US and Bob, Bob alluded to it earlier in his remarks about President Trump. So David Katz has, uh, has made an argument that, um, not quite the same as Trump, mind you, but uh, made an argument that uh, we need to take a, a broader look and think about the financial consequences that come with our precautionary stance. He believes we need to get better data to understand who exactly um, has this illness and once we have a better understanding, perhaps we need to take some sort of risk approach where we start streaming people according to some of the vulnerabilities that Allison referred to. So Mark Lipsitch from Harvard, uh, somewhat similar, but somewhat not so similar as uh, David Katz is kind of pushing back and saying, no, no, we can't start talking about streaming our approach to this uh, particular problem. It's too early. We don't understand enough yet. 
And that we know by looking at other jurisdictions that the consequences of this could be very, very serious. So we have to maintain the precautionary approach. Uh, we can't start talking about streaming. So I'm not sure that David Katz would necessarily disagree with that, but he is saying we do need to get better data and then we have to start having a more tiered approach to the way we approach this problem. So I highlight this as a sample of a debate. Um, some parts of the US are having, and I think in time, depending on how we do, people are gonna start asking questions about how we're adopting a precautionary approach, precautionary stance here. So I'll just end off on a couple of slides with some practical considerations uh, on, this, uh, on this point. So if we assume precautionary approach, uh, we've got to continue to gather data. We need to develop flexible standards, probably not commit ourselves to hard standards for the rest of time based on worst case scenarios, right? So we need to have flexible standards that we adjust through time. And we do have to have an eye on, on our timeline so that how long do we have certain standards in place? When do we revisit? So I think that's one important consideration. So we gotta to continue to gather the data. We have to adopt standards, yes, but have flexible standards that we can adjust up or down depending on the circumstances. And we have to have one eye on the clock. Second thing I would say to those of you working in a public or private or not-for-profit organizations, I do a lot of work with the government though, I think about public servants. Um, it's really the time for a lot of scenario planning um, to, to assume some reasonable worst case scenarios. What does it look like? And I'm not thinking specifically about the health sector at this point. I'm actually thinking about other public agencies that are affected by this, who's, uh, who are monitoring parts of the economy that are really struggling. And you, I think maybe to take a sort of one month, two month, six month outlook and say, what, what does the future look like? What, what could different futures look like depending on certain variables? And how are we going to react to those scenarios? So my practical advice would be that uh, there's, you know, we, we need to start taking a, a longer term view of how we're going to be successful in the medium term in light of something that looks like it continue for quite some time. And the, the economic impact will certainly be felt for some time. So assuming some reasonable worst case scenarios. And remember a lot is uh, not, some of the things that will be under your control, but much of it's not. So do we open the border? Do we close the border? What's the state of the US economy? What's the state of US trade, trade with China? These are things that are not gonna be within the control of your organization, um, but you're gonna have to respond to it. So trying to characterize and describe a narrative of the future or various futures and thinking about how you can be successful in light of whatever the future might hold. Um, couple of other points. Um, our trust in public institutions is incredibly important this particular uh, moment. Um, that one, I think that comes from uh, a Canadian context where Canadians tend to trust public institutions. So it might make it a little bit easier for public institutions to, to let's say, quote unquote, manage Canadians in these times. But public institutions really have to be careful to uh, maintain and earn that trust. So in the trust literature, we talk about three characteristics, openness, knowledge and concern. And so we need to bring those concepts, those principles to bear on what we're doing when we're managing this. Very, very important that we maintain trust in our public institutions at this time in the health sector, but beyond the health sector also maintain the trust. Now, I think that as some of these debates occur, we're gonna recognize that there are differences uh, uh, in the way that the US uh, approaches some of these issues and the way Canada approaches some of these issues. Uh, the U.S. just consistently, uh, trust data suggests that the Americans trust their government less. Uh, they trust people a lot, but they don't trust governments a lot. And, and it would seem that uh, I'm not sure that uh, Donald Trump necessarily uh, shows a lot of trust towards public institutions either. And so as a result, um, their, their proposition to opt for markets and competition and roll back precautionary measures could partly be a function of a society that's a little bit less comfortable with significant government intervention. Um, Canadians are much more comfortable with big government responses. So in fact, it puts more, it puts pressure on public institutions, but probably uh, that's where we want it to be. Um, I thought it was ironic that in the same week that the US was having a debate about whether they, well, some people in the US were having debates about whether or not they wanted to roll back health measures, which started this week. Uh, we were discussing whether or not the Emergencies Act should be adopted. So I think there's kind of an insight into different national dispositions towards these things. I don't want to overstate that. I think the countries have a lot in common, but I do think there's some differences too. Um, I think as we have these debates, as we get more data, as we understand this issue more, we are going to shift away from being an uncertain risk to an ambiguous risk 
because there's going to be some hard politics involved in this eventually. I think it, when you're in the uncertain risk, the best thing for politicians to do is kind of get out of the way and support the health professionals while they try to understand the space. But in time, as we learn more about this risk, um, there's going to be a role, a bigger role for government, and there's going to be politics and political decisions to make uh, in terms of prioritization and the allocation of resources. And so I'll just end on this one point. And I think it maybe echoes uh, some of the sentiments that Bob had expressed that um, I think it's, it's probably uh, important for us not to focus on this sort of markets and competition too soon uh, in this process. Uh, we need to uh, have a probably a redistributive uh, mentality on this because essentially um, if, if you get into a situation where you do leave people behind, um, that can really jeopardize your pandemic plan and kind of create an, you know, arguably an unethical, unfair distribution of resources in bad times. Um, so we need to know that if we're going to take a precautionary stance and that someone's going to pay a high price for that, that they can't go to work, for example, they can't pay their bills, then we're going to have to make sure that there is a collaborative approach to supporting people uh, in those circumstances. Um, you know, arguably because it's the right thing to do, but also because you can get a highly fragmented society in a crisis if we're not bringing everybody with us in our response. So I'll leave you on that point. And I'll just uh, say that I did write a little bit about this in Too Critical to Fail. There's a chapter on H1N1 and media coverage of that particular event. And there's lots of uh, additional literature on risk governance and the IRGC framework in that book if you want to follow up uh, further on these issues. So thank you so much. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Okay, we're all set for the Q&A. Uh, I've, I've got a question on Facebook from Anna for uh, Bob. The healthcare system in Russia, for example, is totally different than the one here in Canada. Starting with the definition of fever, uh, 37 plus is considered a fever in Russia. People are tested and hospitalized with mild symptoms of COVID-19. Will this happen to flatten the curve faster in this case? Yeah, thanks for that. I, I think the Russian case is very interesting because there's been probably a great deal of under-reporting uh, going on within Russia for some weeks now. And now you, you now see uh, President Putin out there wearing a full hazmat suit as he's going out in public. Uh, I think really we could go case by case, nation by nation, but really what, what you have to, what we have to really understand is what are the moral foundations that our health systems are based on? Some of them are very much about emergency management and repairing people once they're ill. Others are absolutely dedicated to health promotion and disease prevention. And that's the key. Once we, once we see just exactly what are these foundations that, that guide and drive health systems around the world, you start to understand and compare where these different methods and designs come out. Uh, so we mentioned Cuba, and that is, a, that is a country that goes right back to the definition of health, 19, uh, 1947 World Health Organization, that it's a, it's a full system of, of, of maintenance of an individual and a population that creates a healthy society. Uh, whereas other countries, um, like I say the US in particular, you, you, you see that for-profit uh, dictum so close to the heart of the U.S. system that it encourages people not to participate in their activities. So in terms of what we can expect in Russia, we'll have to see. But uh, again, what really matters is case by case how these countries are ultimately valuing what is health about. Okay, uh, we have another question uh, that I got an email earlier today to the uh, MIPP at dal.ca. People can submit questions there too. Uh, this one's for Allison uh, from Judith and Peter. Uh, we understand that there may be two strains of COVID-19. Should this be correct? Can you contract both or does one immunize you from the other? How, how do we know which strain one might have caught? Are the symptoms different? Thank you. 
Uh, I don't think that we have enough data right now to really speak to how many strains there are. Really, uh, the coronavirus, again, has a low mutation rate because of its proofreading capabilities. Um, uh, it seems from the analysis of the way different countries are responding to the outbreak, that that's why we're seeing different um, disease, different amounts of case fatality rates and different um, different proportions of severe disease and are not numbers, not so much that there is a, a severe strain and a more mild strain. Uh, there has been some reports that there has been reinfection. Um, so far, I really think this needs to be thoroughly investigated because um, once you recover from a viral infection, um, most often you have long-lived antibodies or cytotoxic T cells that are specific to combat this um, pathogen that should leave you immune for, for several months to several years and sometimes for certain viruses throughout your entire life. Okay, we've got another question from Anna on Facebook, a general question. Uh, Bob mentioned Cuba's help to Italy. Uh, I could add to that 15 Russian airplanes full of medical labs and doctors plus Chinese masks sent out in a form of support uh, to Italy. Uh, will it change the international scene uh, in the long run? If yes, then how? If not, why not? Maybe for, for Bob? Yeah. So again, the sort of outreach that we're seeing between, between countries is, is really important right now. And uh, where Italy is right now, especially in the north, is a system that's completely overwhelmed. It's something where uh, you know, the, the curves that we've seen, they, they did not get ahead of it. The, the amount of people going in and using what is essentially a very well-funded, if not one of the most well-funded, health systems in the world is completely overwhelmed. Some people can't get, can't get care to it. Uh, I think the tragic thing is if we read those curves correctly, we're gonna see a very quick drop off. Uh, and at this point, it's already in a state of crisis. So the help that we're seeing by Cuba, by Russia, by, by, by other countries coming into this zone is, is, is late, right? It's not something that is gonna be in a prevention stage. This is trying to deal with a serious emergency that's on the ground. Uh, the, the next question will be is, is who's next? Um, Spain is now reporting that uh, their, their mortality rate is also increasing. Some estimates uh, by, again, looking at New York City about doubling its number of cases every three days at this point. Uh, will there be need for the US to receive aid from, from foreign nations? Uh, this, is all, this is all up in the air. But um, again, what we're seeing here is a reaction to the crisis, uh, not the sort of uh, prevention strategies that we needed months ago. Okay, we've got another question from Facebook. Uh, Denise from Facebook, uh, I think this is probably best for, uh, for Gaynor. Uh, Denise says, can someone comment on how long precautions, i.e. social distancing will be in place or a best guess? Uh, thanks for that question, Denise. Um, you know, I think that at this point it is a best guess more than anything else, but here's what I would say. Um, I've already spoken to the fact that the Chinese outbreak had a duration so far of about 10 weeks and they're back to baseline and we're all waiting to see whether or not disease will reemerge there. Um, by the same token, BC's outbreak is now approaching, uh, I think uh, the end of week 11, something like that. And here in Nova Scotia, we're at the beginning of week two. So with that in mind, we are looking at, I think at best months before we start to uh, see any ramp down. And the challenge will ra with ramp down will be that now we have different parts of the world experiencing the outbreak in different ways at different times. So we might have a temptation to release our outbreak measures here, to release the social distancing measures here, but it's only safe for us to do that if we can have some assurances that we're not simply gonna get reimportation of the disease from outbreaks that are still flaring up in other parts of the world. 
And so that'll be some of what we'll need to watch at that period of time. So we're often in discussions now as a public health community, both here in Nova Scotia and nationally about when is that? And I think more and more we're coming to the conclusion that um, it's not gonna be only a decision for us. It has to be a decision that we make while at the same time watching what's happening in the rest of the world, because once we sort of pull those plugs, we may not be able to put them back in. And so we, we do wanna make sure that we're not gonna get re-importation re uh, into Canadian jurisdictions. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's one from uh, Charles on Facebook. Uh, it's what about the opportunity to reduce mental health anxiety by a, a minimum universal uh, annual income introduction and comments about that. Um, wasn't addressed to anybody in particular. Uh, would anyone like to comment on that one? The only point I would make on that one is because uh, I've, I've seen that um, issue has come up and uh, I would, I'm, I'm of two minds about this uh, in, in and, and I would point out, I'm not a specialist in this, this uh, policy area about uh, guaranteed incomes, but, um, and I would refer you to the fact that we have a great panel discussion on the McKechnie Institute website about this. There was a panel discussion at the uh, Halifax City Library and uh, people much better qualified to comment on this than I am. But I, I would say if I were, a policy entrepreneur, which is to say somebody who's looking for an opportunity to advance a cause, then I think that sometimes crises and disasters create opportunities for you to make arguments, and this might be one of those times. So if you're trying, so if timing's part of it, this might be, it, arguably, you could try to frame an argument in light of a crisis, right? So a policy entrepreneur would be thinking that way. Um, I think from the risk governance literature, uh, when you're talking about emerging risks, uh, the advice is to not develop new standards in the middle of a crisis and say this is the solution to this problem. So whether it leads to testing out different scenarios, test cases, um, you know, if the, if the evidence were overwhelming, that would be different. I'm not, I'm speaking out of turn here because I don't really know what the evidence is on it. But I think that um, it's important not to adopt really strong standards permanently in light of a particular crisis and say this is the solution now um, you want to maybe be a little more cautious testing things out rather than just being too firm but as I say I say that would not that's a, a general concept uh, and, and one of the things I thought about when I sort of saw these arguments uh, I, I saw it more sort of policy entrepreneurialism rather than uh, than actually uh, uh, a good sensible risk governance solution okay so we got uh two questions just came in and I think that, that then we got to wrap up just in terms of time. Um, but the first one is a question from Kalinda on Facebook. Uh, Kevin, uh, it's for Kevin uh, and or uh, Dr. Watson Creed. Uh, it has been a long time since our society has had to deal with a large number of people dying at nearly the same time. How does the risk uh, community consider the effects of grief at a societal level? Mm -hmm. Gainer or Kevin? Yeah, it's such a beautiful question and I, I wouldn't pretend to know the answer, but it, it's been weighing on my mind um, in part because I, I feel like we're going to feel the grief in multiple ways and in multiple different communities. Um, you know, there is um, the, certainly the loss of connection, there is the uh, potential, the high potential, I think, for widening of disparities uh, as a result of this pandemic, um, the long recovery that that will take and the, and the extension of the grieving period, I think that will go, uh, that will go with that. And there's the day-to-day -day grief that people are still experiencing and now having to, uh, in their lives and having to learn to deal with that in different ways um, throughout this pandemic. So all of that is there for me in this question. Um, I, I guess, you know, one, I, I'm not really sure what the answer is, but one of the things that I, that I, that I point to, I guess, two things. One is that whatever the answer is, um, I think it's going to be something that we're going to have to revisit regularly as this pandemic unfolds. So I think it was Bob, uh, or maybe it was Kevin's slides actually that was making the point that um, there's going to come a point 
probably in the not distant future, in the next few weeks, where we're gonna get tired. We're gonna want to, we're gonna be grieving. We're gonna wanna retract from where we are, um, loosen the restrictions that we have, like the US is talking about now. And the impacts of that could be devastating. And so I think it, this question of how do we, you know, sort of uh, continue to be resilient through that grieving is gonna come up time and time again. I guess the other thing I would say is that, um, there is something in this pandemic, and I, you know, I had the opportunity to have a conversation uh, recently with a, with a former colleague, uh, Senator Stan Kucher, who was reminding me that um, some of what's getting labeled as anxiety in this, and some of what is, is grief, is also related to fear that is appropriate, but also has an antidote in um, um, taking control of what we can. And currently in Nova Scotia, that's taking control of the social distancing um, measures and other measures that you can that you can hang on to sort of to protect your your own family and loved ones. So I think that's part of it too is um, is keeping an eye on what we can control throughout this uh, pandemic. Kevin, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I I, I think about these issues a lot uh, too, Gainer. I I um, so you know I looked at a lot of crises, disasters, uh, you know humanitarian disasters in history. Uh, in my research. And of course, one of the things that's uh, amazing about it is how this has changed over time, over, over you know, centuries about the way we have to deal with, with uh, mass casualties and, and death. And actually, in some cases, not too, too long ago, when we think about the Second World War, the First World War, anyone who's been to a small town in France is always moved by the cenotaph in the middle of a, of a small French village that lists all of the mostly young men, young men, who have died in those villages during the first and second war, world war and you look around these villages and you think these are tiny places and they're listing 30 40 50 young men who died during the first world war uh, and so i i feel part of it is that we can't even uh, relate to that kind of reality how could we even put our mind in that place and understand that i think that would be very hard and i think we're in some respects what i would say uh, picking up a little bit uh on some of the things that uh, Allison and you have talked about, Gainer, is what an incredible story this is in some ways of public health in terms of some of the things that we've achieved in this particular case to manage this risk. It's 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 kind of phenomenal, but we have, I think, over time been sheltered from some of this grief. Uh, and when I think about some of the things that Bob has talked about tonight, um, that there are other parts of the world that have to experience large scale grief all the time and we are sheltered from that experience so it, it's happening elsewhere it's not happening necessarily in our communities and it and it, it, it is i so i feel like the point of departure when i think about sort of the anchoring effect it's different and i think the question i mean in some ways i'm just sort of unpacking the question rather than answering it that it is true that i don't think um we are accustomed to this kind of mass grief and, and maybe one last point on this and some of the work that i have done um so Paul Slovak has done some really great work, a, a risk psychologist, about our ability to uh, address uh, mass suffering. And he's looked at things like genocide and says, you know, why does this keep happening? Every time it happens, we say never again, never again, but it keeps happening. And it's partly because of our inability to process mass suffering, that we can't seem to identify with mass suffering. So those people who are trying to uh, connect with us on this issue will often focus on the power of the one, focusing on the one child who suffers to try to amplify the risk. So in some respects, what we end up having uh, is if, if that one child doesn't reflect a bigger population, then you have this kind of distorted effect that one child dying can set off profound reaction, uh, a, a profound sense of grief, but our ability to, to deal with a thousand kids dying, we're somehow limited cognitively in our ability to engage with that. So there may be this other part of it, there, there's a kind of hardening process or distancing process because you're gonna have to get through it and something's gonna have to kick in and change the way you think about that problem. So I, I, those are some, a few, Thoughts, but I certainly would say that over over time we have become much better off in our society in terms of mass suffering and grief. Uh, just just in terms of the data and how many people do die in these sorts of things, it's a lot less. I don't think we are psychologically, emotionally equipped to deal with these things right now. One, one thing, if I can just jump in real quick, uh, Kevin. 
the uh, I, I do believe that yes, there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of emotion that's going on this time, and I think that we have to be very cognizant that it will pass, it will come to an end, and when it does, there'll be a lot of time for reflection. There may be time for celebration, and I hope that uh, Allison and, and Gaynor, that your offices are on the forefront of that celebration. But I also think that it's a moment to recognize other actors who are keeping things going right now, Our emergency service workers for sure, but but also uh, the, the grocery store workers, the people who are actually still serving gro uh, groceries to people. These are, these are students who are working extra shifts to pay for their tuition. These are pensioners who are supplementing their income and they're right at the forefront of this, mm -hmm. as are many people who are delivering uh, food to isolated individuals through Uber Eats and others. New, newly arrived Canadians who are on low income are absolutely at the forefront of making sure that, that the rest of us don't suffer as hard as we could during this time. And I hope if there's ever a ticker tape parade down the road that uh, we do have the researchers, we do have the medical officers, we have the doctors, and we have the grocery store workers right at the front forefront in that celebration. Okay, we've got, we got a whole Should bunch of questions, uh, but I think we're, we're over time here. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it off to Valerie. Okay, well, I would certainly echo what Bob said. Uh, we do have to be grateful for a lot of our frontline workers who are keeping things going as the rest of us are trying to stay at home. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists, to Gaynor and to Allison. I think you both gave us a very good behind the scenes look at what's happening that some of us wouldn't have any idea about. Bob, it was very sobering to hear what you were having to say. Um, in terms of inequality, I do think we need to look at inequality in, in, in Canada, as well as internationally. Um, and I think what you have to say about health and how we define it is, is very important. Kevin, obviously you asked some very interesting questions and things we should be thinking about and planning for on, on a long-term basis. So I would like to thank my colleagues at CIC who came up with this idea and McKechnie Institute in particular, who took the lead in planning this and in particular Warren who directed